If you have your Bibles, speaking of Bibles, or your Bible app, and you want to follow along in the Scripture, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, we'll be reading the same uh, verses we read last week, verses 11 to 16. The title of my message today is Instructions for a Young Preacher, Part 2. These are the three points we didn't get to last week intentionally. 1 Timothy 4, starting in verse 11, Paul writes to Timothy, a young minister, and he says, Command and teach these things. Don't let anyone despise your youth, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, give your attention to public reading, exhortation, and teaching. Verse 14, Don't neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you through prophecy, with the laying on of hands by the council of elders. Practice these things, be committed to them, so that your progress may be evident to all. Pay close attention to your life and your teaching. Persevere in these things, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Let's pray. Lord, I just ask again that you would just anoint your word. Lord, I pray that you would take these words that were literally written thousands of years ago. And Lord, help us to see how they apply to us today. Lord, I know that your word is alive. I know that your word is active and is powerful. And Lord, I pray that you would change us today through your word. Lord, I pray that we would accept the challenge that you set before us. Lord, help us to be obedient to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul's writing to Timothy. We're in chapter 4. Um, we're more than halfway through this book. And in the, in the first three chapters, in the first part of chapter 4, Paul has given Timothy instructions about how to be, how to be a, a spiritual leader. But then in verse 11, he says, command and teach these things. Saying that the, the teachings of this book aren't just for pastors. They're also for us. He says, command and teach these things. Teach these to the people that are in your congregations. Timothy was probably a, an overseer of multiple house churches in Ephesus. And so he was responsible for raising up other ministers to, to lead these groups. And Paul is commissioning him. Remember, they don't have the written word of God yet. The Bible, the New Testament, hasn't been put together. There's no publishing. Um, back then, every, any kind of manuscript had to be handwritten and Timothy had probably hand copied um, parts, um, um, some of Paul's other letters. Um, the letter to Ephesians probably came to Timothy, but the letter to the Philippians and to Colossians um, were probably cir um, circulated among the churches. And so he may have had some handwritten um, writings of Paul, but Paul says, command and teach these things. So I say that by way of introduction because this message is for us. It's not just for ministers of the gospel. My original sermon plan a couple of weeks ago were these four points, and then last week we did the first point, and today we're going to look at two, three, and four, which of course are now numbered one, two, three. How many wrongs does it take to make a right? Right? Okay, so in mathematics, when multiplying whole numbers. When multiplying whole numbers, if you multiply a negative number times a positive number, you get what? A negative number. If you multiply a positive number times a positive number, you get what? And if you multiply two negative numbers, positive. I still don't understand that, but they told me that's true. Two negatives make a positive if you multiply them. So the three points to this message, two of them are negative. Don't, and the third one is don't, and then the first and the middle one is do. But let's start with don't. Number one, don't let anyone despise your youth. Don't let anyone despise your youth. What is he talking about? NLT, the New Living Translation says, don't let anyone think less of you because you are young. In the NIV, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. You know what age discrimination is? It's when people prejudge you based on your age. Now, Paul is writing, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, and I'm going to broaden it. And don't let anyone look down on you because you're old. Or don't let anyone look down on you because you're in the middle. Jeremiah chapter 1. God calls Jeremiah to be a prophet. Jeremiah writes, starting in verse 4, The word of the Lord came to me. <clears throat> and this is what God said to him. 
I chose you before I formed you in the womb. I set you apart before you were born. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. But I protested, Jeremiah said, Oh no, Lord God, look, I don't know how to speak since I'm only a youth. Then the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a youth, for you will go everywhere I send you and speak whatever I tell you. Do not be afraid of anyone, for I will be with you to rescue you. This is the Lord's declaration. Then the Lord reached out his hand, touched my mouth, and told me, I have now filled your mouth with my words. I will admit this morning, I am not appointed to be a prophet to the nations. That's not me. That was in verse 5, the end of verse 5. But everything else in here, God used to speak to me as a young person. This is the passage of scripture that God gave to me as a ninth grader, eighth or ninth grader, to call me into full-time ministry. And I had some of that same argument, but I am young. And God said, don't say I'm young. I preached my first sermon when I was in high school. I got to preach to my youth group. Before I went away to Bible college, my pastor let me preach to the church. I was young. I was inexperienced. I was green. When I was 25 years old, after graduating from Bible college, I became a lead pastor. I'd been married for four years, and we had no children yet. It was my first pastorate, and I was green. I typed out every word I was going to say in my sermon, and then I read it. I just read my sermon. I did. It's called manuscript style, except it doesn't communicate very well when you never look up and engage the people that you're talking to. But I was afraid I was going to say something wrong, and I wanted to make sure I had it all written out. In speech in high school and speech in college, I could, I could say a speech from a note card. But when you're preaching the Word of God, you don't want to mess it up. Only the weatherman gets paid to be wrong every week. I remember I, when Melanie and I got engaged in, in college, and then we got married, it was like, Melanie loved to speak, and, 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 and I was a little more reserved, believe it or not. And we used to joke, I'd say, Melanie, and I love to study, and it's like, Melanie, I'll write the sermons, you preach them. The problem is she doesn't use notes, so everything I wrote wouldn't matter. <laughs> Young adults are at a disadvantage because of lack of experience. However, young adults may have other advantages like energy, time, eagerness, and recent education. Some Asian cultures are known for their respect and high regard for the elderly. But in the USA, oftentimes the elderly are treated just the opposite. The United States has many laws to prevent and discourage age discrimination. So here's the thing. We can all make excuses why we can't do something. When God called Jeremiah, Jeremiah was eyes, I'm too young. When God called Moses, Moses said, but I can't speak in front of people. When God called Gideon, he called him a great warrior, Gideons. But Gideon from the Old Testament, he's like, he's like I, I'm just a farm boy, I can't, I, no. When God calls us to do something, we can all come up with excuses. Stop it. Yeah, stop it. Because God doesn't call the people who are capable. He calls the people who are available. And God equips those he calls. God will prepare us, and God will enable us to do what he has called us to do. Don't let anyone discriminate against you because of your age or any other reason. Oh, well, you can't do it. You, 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 you know, you can't tell me that because I can do anything. Because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And... I have giftings and callings, and there's things that, that I do well at, and there's things that I'm not, not so good at. But whatever God calls me to do, wherever God calls me to go, I'm going to go, I'm going to do it. I'm going to be obedient. Don't let anyone look down on you because of your age. If God has spoken to you about doing something, do it. If God has spoken to you about getting involved in ministry, do it. If God has spoken to you about reaching out to a family member or a friend that doesn't know Jesus, and you don't know what to say, just do it anyway. Regardless of your age, do not disqualify yourself from ministry. In fact, don't disqualify yourself for any reason. 
Each and every one of us is a valuable asset to the kingdom of God. My associate pastor, when I was um, um, in Clearfield, Pennsylvania, was in a wheelchair. I inherited him. He was there when I came. I didn't let, let him go. Great. Pastor Brian. I love Pastor Brian. We're still Facebook friends. He had some kind of degenerative disease. And uh, when he was in high school, I think he walked with uh, braces and, and crutches. And uh, now as a young adult, he was in a wheelchair. And now he's disabled and he's actually uh, um, in a rehab home. And um, his, his health has deteriorated even more. Pastor Brian used to have to memorize his scripture and his sermons. And so he, he, he could use his hands. He was in a wheelchair. He could use his hands, and he would. And um, I had him preach for me. I, I got to hear him preach. I've heard him preach. And he just has it all memorized. He has, doesn't have any notes. He didn't have a manuscript. He just gets up in his wheelchair, and he just gives praise to Jesus. Because he didn't let anybody tell him he couldn't. God had called him to ministry, and he was serving God in ministry. All of us are a valuable asset. And I brought up Pastor Brian initially to say one of his things. He says, the reason I'm still sucking air is because God still has a work for me to do. I, I had a, a, a nicer version. I believe the only reason we're still breathing is because God's not finished with us yet. God wants to use you in ministry. So, Pastor Ken, how can God use me in ministry? Oh, I'm glad you asked. First one was negative. Don't let anyone look down on you because of your age. Number two, but instead set an example for believers in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity. Be an example. I mentioned last week when Paul told Timothy to teach that we're all teachers, that there are people watching us. There are people in our lives, in our workplace, in our homes, in our families, they're watching us. And we need to be godly examples, not just to believers. Now, he said specifically to believers. And because Timothy was a leader in the church, because he was a pastor and an overseer, it's important. He had to be an example for the believers. But all of us need to be an example for believers and non-believers. We need to be an example. How? There's five things. Here's a whole other sermon I could have preached. In speech and conduct, I like that. In speech and conduct, on your handout it says that Christians should guard what you say and do. How many of you remember the song? We've sung it here. The children's song. Oh, be careful, little hands, what you do. And then it's, oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. There's a father up above who is looking down in love. So be careful, big mouth, what you say. When I sing it, I say big mouth because... There's no little mouth in the Claflin family. Melanie married in. She's got a little mouth. She can be quiet. But uh, us born Claflins, big mouths. We need to be careful what we say. We need to be careful how we act because people are watching. There's an old contemporary Christian song. That's my favorite oxymoron. Old contemporary Christian song. That says, you're the only Jesus some will ever see. You're the only Jesus some will ever see. People are watching us. Melanie has some Christian uh, t-shirts that were left over from what we bought for Christmas. If you want to buy one after, you can. But it says Hamlin Assembly of God on the back. If you're going to wear that in public, act like a Christian. If you're not going to, don't wear that shirt. Put something over it. My youth pastor... Um, was a cocaine dealer who got saved. The courts back then gave him a choice, teen challenge or jail. He chose teen challenge. He got saved, um, got married, married a Christian lady. And uh, he came to my church and um, became, became our youth pastor. And he used to say, now he was, he was very, very um, refined he had a beard. Nobody in my church had a beard. I was like, who, where did you find this guy? I was like eighth or ninth grade. I was like, where did you find this youth pastor guy? I mean, he, he played the uh, mouth harp. We're not allowed to call it a Jew's harp, but anybody familiar with a mouth harp with it? Wah, 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 wah. He sang the blues. Mouth organ, is that what it is? And um, so he used to sing, he used to sing, he used to sing kind of bluesy song. 
He taught me, hello, Jesus, hello. Well, I'm going to be with you where I belong, my life. Anyway, that's Tom Tyndall, right? He used to say, Jesus don't need no bad PR. That's what he used to say. Jesus don't need no bad PR. He said, if you're not going to act like a Christian, don't call yourself a Christian. If you're not going to act like a Christian, don't act like a Christian, and don't get a Hamlin of Something God t-shirt or bumper sticker, please. People are watching us, and not just what we say and do, and then he expounds it. I love it. Then he talks about some, some spiritual qualities in love, in faith, in purity, as Christians, in our culture, we need to set an example of love. The most loving people in any society should be the Christians. So why do we have the reputation of being the most judgmental and the most critical? You can say ouch or amen, it doesn't matter. We need to love people. We need to love people. We need to have faith. We need to be people of faith and purity. The best marriages should be Christian marriages, right? Don't forget the marriage couple retreat. We as Christians, we need to be an example to other believers, to our family, to unbelievers in how, what we say, how we act, how we love, how we believe, and in purity. Those two points were just kind of my warm-up. Number three, it's a negative. Don't neglect the gift that is in you. Don't neglect. What does that mean? Develop the gift that's within you. Use the gift that's within you. Pastor Dan Miller, when he was pastor at Harvest Assembly, now he's at um, Clark's Green, uh, Abington uh, something church, Church of the Abingtons. Uh, pastor Dan Miller, he used to, he used to say, make your passion your ministry. Whatever you're passionate about, turn it into a ministry. You love to do crafts, use it to glorify God. You love to speak, use it to glorify God. You love to build stuff, build stuff for Jesus. You love to break boards, do it for Jesus. That's my thing. I love to break boards for Jesus. That's how God tricked me onto the mission field. I went on a martial arts mission trip. My first mission trip ever was a martial arts mission trip. Melanie had been trying for 30 years to get me to go on a missions trip, and it just took, hey, come break boards for Jesus. I was there. Swing machetes for Jesus. How much fun is that? Get in the town square, tell people about Jesus, break bricks with your forehead. So cool for Jesus. Don't neglect the gift that's in you. What gift did Timothy have? I'm not going to answer that question right away. What gift is he talking about? Well, let's talk about the gifts that we have. First of all, let's de define a gift. What's a gift? It's free. A gift is free. A gift isn't something you earn. It's not something you buy. It's not something you purchase. It's something someone gives you. God has given us all gifts. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, did I even click it? Okay, good. First Corinthians chapter 7, I wish that all people were as I am, but each one has his own gift from God. One person has this gift and another person has that. We're all talented in different ways. Now, there are three kinds of gifts. I made this up, by the way. Three kinds of gifts because as I began to search gifts all over the Bible, and I've got tons of scripture I want to share with you, but I, I categorized the gifts as I began to see, this, was, this blew my mind. First of all, there are free gifts that are for everyone. There's salvation, there's the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, there's the fruit of the Spirit. God wants you to have love, joy, peace, patience, all of that's free, it's for everyone. There are certain things that God wants everyone to have. And then there are specific gifts that are, are for service or for ministry. Now these aren't leadership gifts, these are, are, are just talents and abilities that anybody can have. And then finally, there are gifts where God calls people to be certain vocations, and I'm gonna break these down. So first of all, the free gifts. Let's talk about free gifts. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Eternal life, it's a free gift and it's for everybody. 
God doesn't say it's only for certain people. And there are some Christians that say salvation is only for certain people. God predecided in advance who's going to. God knows in advance who's going to receive him. But God didn't say, okay, you get to go to heaven. You don't get to go to heaven. You get to go to heaven. You don't and you don't because more people are going to. Never mind. But it's whosoever will may come. The Bible says anyone who calls on the name of the Lord, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's why we got to tell people. The Gideon ministry is working the, 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 uh, um, the game, not the game, the, they're, they're working on numbers. Numbers, 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 numbers. If you give out a thousand Bibles, you probably don't get a thousand salvations right there at that moment. Yeah, it would be great, right? The potential is there for that. But the more Bibles you get, maybe 1%, maybe if one, I don't even want one percent, maybe 1% will come to Christ. Well, then if you give out 100 Bibles, only one person is going to come to Christ. But if you give out 100 million Bibles, then a million people come to Christ. See how that works? So salvation's a free gift. We need to tell everybody because we don't, thank you, because we don't know who's going to be ready to receive. Ephesians 2, 8, for you are saved by grace through faith, and it's not from yourselves, it is God's gift. Salvation is a free gift, but the good news is it's for everyone. In Acts 2, 38, there's another free gift. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. The power of God is available to all of us. We struggle. We're weak. We're human. We have, we have weakness. We have failure. But God's power, His Holy Spirit, is available to all of us. It's a free gift. The next group of gifts were specific gifts for ministry. And last week, we talked about them. Did I get ahead of myself? No, I'm going to skip that one. Last week, we talked about it from Romans chapter 12. And I read this last week, verses 6 through 8. According to the grace, and grace is free, according to the grace given to us, in other words, according to the, the, the grace of God, the goodness of God given to us, we all have different gifts. If it's prophecy, use it according to the proportion of one's faith. If it's service, to serve people, then serve. If it's teaching, teach. If it's encouraging or exhorting, do it. If it's giving, give with generosity. If it's leading, lead with diligence. If it's showing mercy, do that with cheerfulness. These are, these are gifts that, that anybody can have that God has given us. Some of you are really nice. It's your nature. Some of you, and I'm going to look the other way, some of you are sickeningly sweet. Have you ever met somebody like that? That just their sweetness just oozes everywhere. Um, one of my pastor's wives, when I was growing up, she was that way. She was just like so sweet. You, you could never be like angry at her. She taught my, my um, middle school Sunday school class, and she told us we couldn't play any games of chance. It was a sin. She came at us hard. And if it has dice in it, remember trouble, you push the little button and the dice would, you know, can't play trouble anymore. If, if it's a poker deck of cards, you can't play any games that use a poker deck. You can't play rummy, it's a sin. And so she's telling us all this. But she was so sweet, I couldn't be mad at her. You know, so it's a gift. She has that gift of sweetness. Some of you aren't so sweet. You have the gift of prophecy. You know, you have the gift of, I'll get in your face and tell you how it is. You know, but sometimes that's needed. And God can use us, and most of us are somewhere in the middle of that spectrum, right? But these are our talents and abilities and personality qualities, free gifts that God has given us that we can use for the kingdom of God, that we can use to bring people to Jesus. In 1 Peter 4, verse 7 through 11, um, as we go down to verse 10, it says, Just as each one has received a gift, use it to serve others as good stewards of the varied, the varied, the variety of the grace of God. 
If anyone speaks, let him speak as one who speaks the words of God. If anyone serves, let it be from the strength that God provides, so that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ in everything. We all have gifts and abilities, and God wants you to use your gifts and abilities for him. The third kind of gifts only applies to people in spiritual leadership. It's, I call them vocational gifts, people who are called to ministry. And he says he gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. But I want to expand those vocational gifts because those are spiritual leadership. But, you know, I think some people are called to special vocations. Some people are called to, to the helping industry. Some people are called to children's work. Some people are called, um, have you ever had, how many of you have ever been in a hospital or, or had to deal with a nurse? Anybody had nurses take care of you? How many of you have had bad nurses? Anybody remember a bad nurse? Yeah, we remember. Dear Lord. Anybody had a good nurse? Those, they stand out. It's like, it's like that's, that's their calling. That's, that's, what, that's what God created that person to do. And those other ones need to become doctors or something. But whether it's doctors, nurses, whether it's building Thanks. My dad was mechanical. My dad dropped out of school in sixth grade. He got drafted um, just before Vietnam. He went into the army. He was a, a machinist. He got his GED there. But my dad could fix anything. And when my, my, my dad wasn't an auto mechanic per se, but he grew up on a farm and he, he knew his way around a wrench. Okay. So what, when I was at preschool, before I was in kindergarten, because I know from the house we were living in, um, because I started kindergarten in that house, my dad's pickup truck broke down. And it was his transportation to work. My, my mom had a car, but it, my dad took a week off of work, literally walked to the auto parts store and the public library. Jerry, he checked out the Chilton book. He did. And my dad spent a week rebuilding the engine of his pickup to save money. Never done it before <laughs> and just did it. And then it became a thing for him after that. He got better at it, and, and he, then he used to rebuild engines um, for extra income. But the first time he rebuilt an engine is because he needed to, and he couldn't afford to do anything different. My dad was gifted when it came to mechanics. My dad could, if it was mechanical, he could figure it out. I still, I can close my eyes. I can see my dad right now sitting underneath the wall phone in our kitchen at the kitchen table. My mom wasn't happy. I remember this vividly. He's sitting there with a carburetor, and he was rebuilding it with gasoline, cleaning it with gasoline. He's got, he's got a jar of gasoline and a carburetor at the kitchen table and a toothbrush. But it was a vocational gift. You may know what God has called you to. Maybe you have a vocational gift, and it can be anything. It can be anything. We need, we need really good pen dot workers. Somebody say amen. Yeah? So snow plowing, that's a ministry, folks. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, actually, before I read that, I'm going to ask you to stand. Because this verse, I knew this was going to come just before my conclusion. This verse is so important. Paul writes 1 Timothy, gives him all these instructions, and then just before Paul dies, he writes 2 Timothy. It might have been the last letter he wrote. And in verse one, or in, uh, chapter 1, verse 6 through 8, Paul writes this. He says, Therefore, I remind you to rekindle the gift that is in you through the laying on of hands. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, our text, Paul says, Don't neglect the gift that's in you. And in 2 Timothy later, years later, Paul writes again, just before he dies, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that's in you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power, love and sound judgment. So don't be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Instead, share in the suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God. What is the gift that Timothy had? It was the gift of being an overseer, of being a pastor of pastors. Paul, God had called Timothy to be an apostle. And as Paul was dying, about to die, Timothy was the next generation. And Paul writes and he says, rekindle the gift in case, 
you forgot what I said years ago, or in case you have slacked off, or in case you've gotten older and you've maybe gotten a little tired, rekindle the gift. And that's really my message today to all of us. Don't let people look down on you because you're too young or you're too old or you're in the wrong place in the middle. Don't let anybody look down on you because of your height or your weight or your strength or your weakness. Ignore what people say. Listen to what God has to say. And God says, set an example in a variety of ways. And then he says, don't neglect the gift. There may be someone here this morning that God has called you to full-time ministry. Maybe it was a long time ago. And maybe you've neglected it. Maybe you've put it off. Maybe you've said, it's too late. I can't do it. I don't want to lose you as a part of this body, but if God's called you to ministry, you need to pursue that. Maybe God called you to missions and you've put it off. Well, you can start in August and you can go with us to Africa. You begin praying about it now, begin saving for it now, and see if maybe God will give you more direction, more clear direction. Maybe God hasn't called you to full-time missions, but it's missions has been on your heart for years. Now is the time to go. Now is the time to see what God has for you. I was afraid of missions my freshman year in Bible college. I've shared this before. It's like, God, don't call me to missions, don't call me to missions, don't call me to missions. But every Friday night, there was a mission service on campus. And I went to it every Friday night, not because I was interested in missions, but because they had altar time that didn't end. In chapel, at 1030, get out of here and get to your 1045 class. You know, great sermon, you don't have time to pray about it. Get to class. The local churches, they, 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 they seem like I get sometimes. It's time to end and go. But this Friday night service was like, you can stay and pray as long as you want. The only problem was all the speakers were missionaries. It was like, guys, can't you get somebody else? But it was a mission service, but I'd go. And so, so I, and I always sat over here, over here. There was this right there. There's no seat there, but that's where I sat. Every, every Friday night that I could go, I didn't go absolutely every Friday night, but, and I wrestled with my freshman year, God, are you calling me to missions? Because I felt very strongly called to be a pastor. I was like, okay, God, I give up. I give up. I'll be a missionary. And God literally spoke to me. Thanks, that's all I wanted to hear. Now go be a pastor. And then I quit being afraid God was going to call me to missions all the time. When I retire, that's what I want to do. I want to do missions, home missions in the U.S. as well as foreign missions. That's how, that's, to me, that's my idea of perfect retirement is, you don't retire from ministry. Rekindle the gift. Whatever God, whatever gifts God has given you, if you have laid them aside, I want to encourage you to rekindle the gift today. And maybe it's just a new thing and God's just beginning to reveal it to you. Then I'm going to say what he said in the first book. Don't neglect the gift. Don't neglect the gift. Let's bow our heads in prayer. I'm going to ask, every head bowed, every eye closed, I'm just going to ask, if God is speaking to you about something, I, I don't need to know what, I'm not going to ask you what, but if God is speaking to you about something and God is asking you to commit, then just raise your hand. I want to pray with you. Just raise your hand and put it back down. If God is speaking to you about something, God sees your hands. God sees your hands. Thank you for being honest with God. In these moments, I want us to just take time. The weather is still good, by the way. I've got my eyes open. Now I'm going to close them again. The weather's still good. We have time. Allow God to continue to speak to you. And I would encourage you right now to say yes to Jesus. We sang that song, I have decided to follow Jesus. But have we decided to go where he wants me to go? Lord, I'll go where you want me to go. I'll say what you want me to say. Give God some time right now. Allow God to continue to speak to you and commit yourself to him. Lord Jesus, I thank you for every person that's here today. I thank you for those that are online with us today. Lord, I believe that you are speaking to us. And Lord, I thank you for those hands that were raised and for every hand that was raised and for the couple that weren't raised that should have been raised. Lord, I pray that you would continue to speak to those people. Lord, I pray that you would encourage them in to use their gift for you. Lord, help them to realize that they're not a has-been. It's not too late. They're not too old. Lord, maybe some of them that they're not too young. 
that they're not too inexperienced, Lord, that they're not too uneducated. But Lord, I pray that you would, would, would breathe life into that gift, into that, that calling that you've placed on their life. And Lord God, I pray that they would use it to glorify you and that they would seek training if that's what they need to do. Lord, that, that they would seek the next step. For everyone that raised their hand today, Lord, I pray that they would seek the next step. What is it I need to do next so I can be obedient to what God is calling me and asking me to do? Lord, I pray that today it would be a time of commitment for all of us. Lord, that we're going to be obedient. Lord, for me as a pastor, Lord, help me to rekindle the gift, the calling that you placed in my life. Lord, I thank you, Lord God, that you've allowed me the privilege to be pastor here. Lord God, help me to be a better pastor. Lord God, help my sermons to be better. Lord, help my ministry, my pastoral ministry to be better. Lord, I pray that you would just have your way in us, not just me, but in all of us. Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your faithfulness. And then, Lord, I, I pray for those that are here today, Lord, that are online. Lord God, that are listening to this message. Lord, maybe they've, they've never really even started the first step. Lord, maybe there's someone here today, they've not accepted you as their Lord and Savior. Or maybe they did a long time ago, or when they were a kid. Lord, that free gift for everybody starts with salvation. And Lord, if there's somebody here today that needs to receive salvation, Lord, I pray that they would right now just invite you, Jesus, into their life. Lord, I pray that in their heart, in their mind, even with their mouth, they'd say, Dear Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sins and help me to be the child of God you want me to be. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for my sins. Please forgive me. Please adopt me into your family. Lord, if we pray a prayer like that, Lord, the Bible says that if we believe in our heart and we receive Jesus, that we will have the right to become children of God. Lord, I pray that you would minister to every single person, Lord, that is in this room today and it's online with us, Lord. I just pray, Lord God, that we would commit ourselves to you. Lord, help us to not neglect the gift, the ability, the talent, the calling that you've placed on our lives. And Lord, if it's been a while, help us to rekindle that gift. Help us to bring that spark back. Help us to give it the oxygen, that fire, that spark it needs to burst into flames. And Lord, help us to be on fire for you once again. Lord, again, I thank you. Lord, I pray that your word, Lord, would speak true to our hearts. And Lord, that we not forget on Monday or on Tuesday or later in the week what you've spoken to us today. Help us to follow through on our commitment with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.